everyone. Welcome to our Sunday evening teaching series as we've been uh, going over the book of Ecclesiastes. We have made it to a week 11. Um, I know I originally said that this is a 12-week series. Um, week 12 is a wrap-up. And I thought instead of recording the video for week 12, uh, I may publish uh, an outline of some questions. Um, what that one really is, is, is a series of questions of reflection. Uh, and so this will be our last video in the series. And then I will follow it up next week with uh, some questions for reflection. Uh, and so I hope you have enjoyed this uh, walk through this book. I've mentioned before, this is a personal favorite of mine. Um, because of the themes and, and just how it really does call all of life um, into question and it, it hopefully draws us to God. And that's what we're going to see today. We're going to see the writer's conclusion. The preacher uh, gives us his final words and hopefully it won't come as a shock to you what those words are. Um, I've titled our, our last uh, uh, walk through this together. Um, remember your creator and that's really what we're going to be doing here is, is considering thinking about remembering our creator God and you know is that a surprise to us I, I would argue that it shouldn't be because this is where the um, preacher has been pushing us all along isn't it this is where he's been directing our attention and directing our focus everything um, the world and um, love of money and, and love of people and love of things and all of these opportunities to seek our pleasure and our gain and our value and our worth and our meaning apart from God what have we said is meaningless is like catching smoke or chasing vapor that's here today and gone tomorrow it's like a mist it, it it quickly comes and it quickly goes away apart from God that is what we can see our life as but in God there's life and so we will look at the final words of the preacher this evening as we consider chapter 12 uh, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 14 we're going to see this in three parts this evening in verses 8 through 12 uh, we're going to get one last string of true wisdoms, um, one last piece of information, one last bit of uh, parting of truth from the preacher. We're going to go back to verse 11, and we're going to talk about the one shepherd um, and what it means to be serving and loving and living under that one shepherd. And then finally, we will conclude uh, with the preacher's message to fear God and keep his commandments. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. But uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll read our text, and then we'll dive in uh, this evening, shall we? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come before you this evening grateful. Grateful for your word. Grateful that you've blessed us as a church with opportunity to study it both locally and online. We thank you for how you've provided for us during this time of pandemic and quarantine. And Lord, we do pray that you would be with our brothers and sisters around the world as they suffer. Um, we pray for a swift end to this virus, if it be your will. We pray that you would give us an abundance of grace and mercy to love our neighbors, even when what's being asked of us is difficult. Father, I thank you for this time of study in your word. I thank you for the preacher and his uh, commitment and diligence to write all of this down. I ask that you would be with us in this time of study, that you would give us wisdom as we seek to find it in your word, that you would open our ears, our hearts, and our minds, and we might receive it with gladness and with joy. This world is facing a lot of difficulty, and so we ask, O oh Lord, that you would show your hand upon it in your grace and your mercy. Lord, teach us to love as you love. Teach us to live as you live. Teach us to serve as you serve, and help us to do this in your word and through it. Amen. Well, this is the word of the Lord for us this evening. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'll begin in verse 8. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. 
The words of the wise are like goads, and the nails, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and of much study there is weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The grass may wither and the flower may fade, but the word of our Lord will stand forever and accomplish everything he has set out for it to do. Thanks be to God. Or shall we? Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanities. You would expect him to get through uh, his last section without including this one last time. And, and if you are walking through this with your Bible, you may notice that um, most people put this with the previous section, but I actually think it goes with this concluding section. Um, the preacher goes into kind of his, his resume, if you will, besides being wise, so he claims himself wise. He also taught the people knowledge. He claims himself knowledgeable. Weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. Just as a, a reminder point that takes us all the way back to the beginning, this is one of the reasons I do think that Solomon wrote this letter. Um, he wrote some of the proverbs. Um, he would be able to consider himself wise and knowledgeable. Um, it would be very easy for him to take this title uh, for himself. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. Now we know that absolute truth, that the real truth or true truth, if you will, um, comes from God. And so in some ways, I, I believe that the preacher here is saying that the words he wrote are the very words of God. And isn't that what we call the Bible? The inerrant, infallible, divine word of God. All scripture is God-breathed. God breathed, spirit filled, the word of God. That's what we call these words. And so the, the preacher here is kind of giving us says, this is why you should listen to me. Here is my rationale for telling you everything I've told you. These are my words of wisdom. I am wise. Listen to someone who is wise. Listen to me. Now, I'm not pointing to myself, by the way. I don't claim to be one who is wise. I, I'm a student of wisdom, but I'm not there yet. Um, but uh, remember, I'm talking to you from the perspective of the preacher. And then he goes on to say, with that as credentials, he gives this as his, his point. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. Now, we need to talk about this for a moment. The words of the wise are like goads. What was a goad? Well, a goad um, in uh, ancient times would be a stick with a, that came to a pointed end. Think of like a pencil. Um, it was kind of pencil shaped. And it could be used to poke at the hindquarters of a sheep or of a cow or of a certain animals. Uh, to get them to move. It was a, a utensil to cause action in its subject. And so the shepherd, when he needed the sheep to move, and they weren't willing to do so on their own, would poke them um, with this goad. Um, Johnny Cash has a, a great line um, about this. Um, when the man comes around, I believe as the song gets in, and he, he has a line how hard it is to kick against the goats, um, to, to fight against the tool that's being used to spur you on, to move you. Um, and sometimes that's God has to use this. God, God has to, to spur us into action. God has to, to poke at us a bit, to get us off our laziness and get us into um, doing what we need to be doing. The words of the wise are like goads. The words of wisdom shake us out of that sleep. The words of wisdom push us forward. The words of the wisdom of wisdom move us to action. And what the preacher is saying here then is this book, this compilation, this set of instructions that he's written out over 12 chapters 
is a giant goad that's meant to poke you and wake you up and get you out of your days and cause you to do something, to live some way, to act some way, to be something. Now what that is, he's going to get to in just a moment. But his kind of final impartation of wisdom is to heed God's word. Is to listen, and not just listen, but act, but perform, but do, but live. Live it out. My son, beware of anything beyond these. This is enough. That is what you need to, to listen to God's word and to heed it. And then he has this funny state, statement here of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Now, I will say while we were in seminary, this kind of became a banner uh, cry of us students, especially the, the more years you got under you. You know, Ecclesiastes 12.12 12, of making many books, there is no end and much study grows weariness. Um, now, I say that in jest. Seminary is, a, is an opportunity for joy, um, and uh, I delighted in the opportunity to be there. Uh, but there is a point that you just, you can't, you don't feel like you can take in an, anymore. Um, you know, there's fascinating information uh, about social media and um, about how we get so much information that for lack of, uh, of a better words here, either doesn't directly apply to us or isn't beneficial. Um, you know, we talk about spheres of influence. You most directly have influence to those that are closest to you. And the further they get from your family, friends, work, neighborhood, community, region, you know, the further the circles go, the less impact you can potentially have and the, the less, I would say, worry or concern we should have. Now, yes, we should be um, concerned about world hunger. Yes, we should be concerned about what's going on in the Middle East. Yes, we need to care about those things. But as far as what you can directly influence and be influenced by, let's start locally. Let's start in the home. Let's start in the neighborhood. Let's start in the community. Let's start in work. because. What we find ourselves in social media, we can wear ourselves out. You know, this tragedy happened in London. This tragedy happened in Egypt. This tragedy happened in France. And, and they are tragedies, but we can wear ourselves out by, by constantly pulling things in and not really being able to do anything with them. And I think that's what the preacher is trying to get at here with, with studying many books of just taking in knowledge is good and is great and we should read and I'm a big proponent of reading but we just need to, to have the right mindset with it and not just consume to the point of despair no on our litmus test our, our, our focus our balance in that study the Word of God the Word of God will bring us to wisdom, will make us wise, will be like that goad that spurs us to action and actually causes us to do. Because how often do we read something online, do we hear some bit of news, and we're like, oh, that's so terrible, that's so sad, now I'm in a sad mood, and then we don't do anything about it, because we can't. So let, let, let's tighten those spheres down, let's let God's word be that goad that spurs us into action. And then let's think about what we can do with it. Now, let's move on to our next point. Um, they are given by one shepherd. Now, you've got this analogy of sheep and of shepherd. Um, and in some ways, we've talked about God's word being uh, the goad. Well, then, who is the shepherd and who are the sheep? Well, that's easy. The sheep are us. Um, we, like sheep, have gone astray. Jesus knew and used uh, this analogy over and over and over again in the New Testament, as did many people throughout the biblical accounts. Why? A lot of the people in this time were sheep herders. And so this was an analogy directly applicable. But also, we kind of get a sense of what it's like to care for sheep, to watch after sheep, and to protect sheep. And, 
I'm sure you've heard enough sermons or watched the documentary or, or done the very thing that I, I warned about in the last section about taking in a lot of useless knowledge. This actually is useful or beneficial because if we learn a little bit about that process, we come away going, man, it's a wonder sheep live on their own. They need a lot of help. And then to say that we're like sheep, it makes us go, oh, oh, wow, yeah. We do need help. We need help. Help us. The goat is God's word. Then the shepherd is God himself. Jesus Christ, I am the good shepherd. You are my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and come when I call. I am the door to the sheepfold. Jesus himself saying that he is the good shepherd, that he is the caretaker of the sheep, that he is the one that will defend the sheep with his very life. He will give it up for them because he loves them and he cares for them. And ultimately, he's the only one that can. And so when we we think about the fact that we're the sheep and we think about the fact that Jesus is the shepherd, that God's word is that goad that he uses to to spur us on through the working of the Holy Spirit, where are we to go? And that, that takes us to our final section here. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Fear God. For, for, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The, the concluding point, the, the final section, fear God and keep his commandments. You know, we get a heavy dose of love God uh, nowadays. God is love, and we, we talk about that, and, and I don't think it's wrong to make that statement because God is definitely loving, and, and the truest form of love is, is the self-sacrificial, the, the, the self-denying love of our God and our Savior. But we don't always talk about how we're to rightly fear God. We don't always talk about how we're called to fear God out of love and out of respect, but fear Him we shall. I mean... There's plenty of occurrences in the Bible of, of people who sinned and, and were faced with immediate judgment. Immediate judgment. And then at the same time, there's people who deserved immediate judgment and weren't given it. I mean, think about the people of Nineveh. They had done atrocities to the Jewish people. And that's why Jonah didn't want to go. He didn't want to go because he was scared, not of the people, but that God would actually forgive him. He feared God. He feared God would do what God is capable of doing. Now, and I would not in any of us would say dare to be a Jonah by any regards, but at the same time, I think we've lost that, that fear of our creator, of our maker. You know, a southern saying often said by mothers who are growing weary of their children is, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. And we would often think, okay, mom, okay. That's how you're going to play that one. But God says and God promises death will come to all of us. And I think of Nadab and Abihu I think of the, the couple in the, the New Testament. Their names are um, escaping me right now. The couple that uh, sold the land. Um, I'm thinking of, of many that death came upon them swiftly because they defied the Lord. Fear God and keep his commandments. Obey. Obey God. Obey God's word. This is his final point. All of life is vanity apart from God. All of life is meaningless. All of life leads to this selfish, self-centered nothingness. But in God there's light and there is life and there is good news. And our call, our challenge is to fear Him, to keep His commandments, to love Him, to love one another. 
For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. God will make it all known. God knows and God will make it known on the day of judgment. And you now will have to give an account. And so how are we going to act? How are we going to respond? What are we going to say to that God? And my challenge to us um, is that we take this to heart. We take this letter to heart and we do seek God with who we are and what we have. And we seek to grow in our love and understanding of him so that our life is not vanity. Because apart from Jesus Christ, it is vanity. It is meaningless. But in Jesus, if you are trusting him by faith for his shed blood, for his sacrifice on the cross, for his death in place of your death, that you may have life. If you are resting in that, if that is your hope, if that is your reason for living, then you have a life worth living. But if you're trusting anything else, if you're resting in anything else, then it is vanity. It is meaningless. And it won't get you anywhere. Well, it's been a delight to, to study this book with you. And as we find ourselves coming to a close, um, I pray that uh, you have a blessed week. Um, I pray that you take this time to reflect as a family or as an individual. And I pray that you continue to study God's word and let it challenge you. Let it spur you to him. For in him we find light and we find life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to be in your word this evening. I thank you for your people and their willingness to put up with me um, and to endure this series. I ask that you would watch over us um, as we go our separate ways. I pray that you would give us a blessed week, a week full of your word. Help us to be careful not to seek the temptations of this world, but to truly find rest and hope and joy in you, for that will have meaning and purpose in life. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. We ask all of this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.